This is Negotiate X TV. Hello and welcome to the Negotiate X podcast. I am your co-host and co-founder, Nolan Martin. With me is my good friend, as always, Mr. Aram Denisian. Aram, how are you doing, sir? I'm great. I'm, I'm especially great because I get to introduce uh, a friend and colleague uh, today to the program. You know, over the years, Nolan, and doing this work, I've been introduced to some just amazing people who are, you know, not just thought leaders in, in this practice of negotiation and, and conflict transformation, but are out there doing really hard work. And, and today, our guest, um, Hal Abramson, uh, really epitomizes those things, uh, a thought leader, a teacher, uh, and a practitioner. So let me introduce Hal uh, and get us going. Hal is a full-time faculty member at Turo Law Center uh, in New York, where he has taught, trained, arbitrated, mediated, and published articles and books on negotiations, mediation, advocacy, and intercultural and international disputes for more than 30 years, okay? When, once you go over 30 years, you just go 30 plus, right? Because because Hal, Hal, Hal's really only, he's Hal's, Hal's only 45 years old, Right. So he's been doing this since a teenager. Um, Hal's teaching training experiences include helping the negotiation program at the U.S. Air Force Academy, where I had the opportunity to serve with and and work with Hal, as well as teaching at two of the top alternative dispute resolution programs in the U.S., Cardoza Law in New York City and UNLV Law School in Las Vegas. Hal has also taught or trained on dispute resolution in 19 countries on six continents. Uh, did you not get to Antarctica, Hal? Is that... Uh, yeah, I have to have something to look forward to. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Hal's received numerous awards for his publications and mediation, such as the annual book award of the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution with his book, Mediation Representation, Advocating as a Problem Solver. And even more recently, his article on Nelson Mandela as a negotiator, which received the CPR award for the best professional article. And I hope we can talk a little bit about, about that article and, and your choice of Nelson Mandela uh, now as we get in. Hal's experience, uh, expertise extends far beyond the classroom as well. In connection with the new Singapore Mediation Convention, he represented IMI and IAM and assisted the U.S. State Department when the U.N. drafted the treaty on enforcing cross-border mediated settlement agreements. In addition to participating in drafting sessions over three years, he served as an expert advisor to the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law when he designed three mediation education programs on the UN for the UN delegates. He also co-chaired the first symposium on the convention after it was adopted by the General Assembly. The symposium included speakers who helped draft the convention and prepared chapters for a book that he edited and has been published. This is only a fraction, folks, of the accomplishments uh, in 30 plus years of being an educator and practitioner. It is a joy to welcome you, Hal, to our program. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Hal. So as we kick things off here, I'd like to kind of know more about your journey of how you got to um, become a negotiator, and then also, were there any key developments along the way on that path? Well, it's an interesting question for all of us, why we get involved in this field. And, um, and the reality is, we all know we're negotiating all the time. So the question is, when do we realize uh, we could use a little bit of education <laughs> and how to do a little better? Because, you know, I've taught mediation for many years, uh, and when you teach mediation, that's a delight because that's new to everybody. But when you teach negotiation, everyone's already a negotiator. Everyone's already got experience. Everyone's already a expert to some extent. Uh, so for me, uh, when I was in law school, which more than 30 years ago, I like that reference point. Let's stick with that. Uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, I, there weren't, were no negotiation courses. It was a, a brand new field. It wasn't even a field at that point. This is the early 1970s. And, um, and I was interested in the subject at the time, but there was nothing to learn. My material wasn't there. So then I practiced law for a while and, um, there's a public policy work, uh, and then decided to go back to school after eight years. And I go back to a, a school in your neck of the woods, close to your neck of the woods in Boston, um, and go to the Kennedy School of Government. And I said, huh, maybe there's a chance to take a course in negotiation. 
is there such a course? And there was one, but not the Kennedy School, not the law school yet. They had some courses in their early stages, uh, but there's a course being offered at the School of Education. And so I said, okay, I'll take that. And I go sign up for the course. It is filled. It's packed with hundreds of people. And they bring in guest speakers. What else do you do when you have a new idea, a new course? The, uh, there's, there's no textbook yet. There's no uh, single expert. So they brought in a bunch of speakers. And one of the speakers was a guy by the name of Roger Fisher. And he comes in and he says, hey, I just published a brand new book. Again, more than 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and he starts describing to us getting to yes and what this book is about. I actually have a first edition of that book, a hard co cover one of that. It's green, by the way, the book. Yeah. <laughs> I think Roger Fisher probably would agree with that. <laughs> uh, so, um, so that began, that became my first formal introduction to thinking about and studying uh, dispute resolution and negotiation as a separate field. Um, and it was, it was a hodgepodge of a course because the field had not been very well developed at that point. And it was done using a Harvard Business School model of a lot of case studies. And one of the case studies that they did was, it's pretty interesting given his, from a historical perspective, uh, was on the negotiation or releasing the hostages in uh, Iraq. And they, um, and what happened was that just happened a year or two before. So it's really fresh in everyone's mind. And we know what a disaster all that was with the hostages being held for over a year and then all being released on January 20th, the day that uh, President Reagan uh, is sworn in as president. And so I'm in this class and we're studying what could Carter and his team done differently. And of course, I'm at Harvard. So this is not a group of people that lack confidence. And everyone had opinions on what they should have done after the fact. And I'm just sitting there just listening. I, I had no idea what should have been done. Um, we all were frustrated by uh, the protracted uh, process. and and horrifyingly protracted process. And so um, at the end of the discussion, there's a new class, large class. The professor announces, by the way, we do have in the class someone who is there. And we had in the class one of the two women hostages. We didn't know that. And the whole room went silent. And everyone just stopped talking and this woman started describing her perspective of what was going on while she was there for a year as a hostage and the lesson I walked away with we have to have a lot of humility when it comes to understanding disputes and understand what's going on because she shared stories with us that many of us had not even contemplated and had a perspective that we didn't have it became for me a very early lesson thinking about negotiation is that we have to be good listeners. You have to be ready to learn. You have to be ready to hear other people uh, before we can start deciding how to proceed in negotiation. So that was a very formative experience for me. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Alan. I'll tell you, and I know we'll, we'll build on this. You, you always, in my opinion, in the years I've known you, um, you know, just demonstrate that humility, the willingness to, take on someone else's perspective to listen and to learn. So thanks. You know, in one of your articles that I, that I've enjoyed reading, um, you discuss the difference between good practice tactics and tricks. It might be helpful for our listeners to maybe just, you know, you can kind of, as we start off here, hear some of the kind of the theory that informs your thinking and your practice around negotiation, whether it's that model or, or anything else kind of, you know, what, what, what is it that drives the way you think and approach negotiation? Well, that article you're referring to is a relatively recent article uh, that's called Good Practices, Tactics, and Tricks in, uh, Negotiation Styles. And it was a really interesting research project for me because one of the things that always struck me in the field of negotiation is that a lot of people have made catalogs, a list of the do's and don'ts of how to negotiate. 
and two people that are very influential in my thinking who I have extremely high regard for, they're professors, and have done some really uh, significant uh, informative work in this field, uh, is Charles Craver from uh, George Washington uh, Law School, and John Wade, who from th at that time was from uh, uh, in Australia teaching there. Um, and they both spent a lot of time cataloging a lot of specific uh, strategies and tactics and ploys used by negotiators. Um, and uh, John, what he did is he created these baseball cards. <laughs> and he'd have these baseball cards, and, and on one side would say, if the person does X, flip the card over, and here are six responses. And then what Charles Craver has done is that he has written article after article describing, cataloging all these different detailed strategies employees people engage in uh, that uh, was designed to inform us of what to be aware of when you go into negotiation. And I look at those lists and I go, how are we supposed to memorize this stuff? How are you supposed to teach this stuff? So it got me thinking about, is there a way to simplify this? To make it so that this information can be accessible at your fingertip in a negotiation that is fast moving, you have no time to reflect. You have to go to what I like describing as your default process. That's all you can do. You can go with your instinct. And you need something to inform that instinct. And that's when I started developing this idea called good practices, tactics, and tricks. Good practices is a general category that covers all the things we are always teaching in negotiations. You know, identifying interests, being good listeners, ethics, all the things that we talk about, and Roger Fisher talked about in his uh, and Bill Urey and they're getting to Yes book that uh, comprise good practices of negotiator. And everyone's always teaching that in any, any textbook, any class. And so that becomes good practices. Tactics is a really intriguing second category for me because tactic is what people use all the time in negotiations, but they're really, upon closer examination, a little disappointing that we do this stuff. So, for example, one of the common tactics we all know, everyone uses, very common, no one gets upset when it's done, is extreme first offers. What I like to say to people is, you know, could you try to explain this to an eight-year-old? Explain to people, to an eight-year-old, here's how to be a good negotiator. Go into a negotiation, make an offer that's extreme, that you know no one's going to accept. It's not really a real offer. You're going to hide that for a while. And then eventually you'll get to what you really want. Now, when you present it that way, it becomes so obvious how silly it is. And yet it is so ingrained in our culture. It's so ingrained in the way we do things. And it's been supported by a lot of psychological analysis that we have to accept that that's the reality. But let's label it. Let's not label it as a good practice. Let's label it as a tactic. And here's the key. A tactic poses risk. Good practices do not. So a tactic poses a risk, meaning that when discovered, it could hurt or undermine or dilute uh, uh, the confidence in this negotiation relationship with the other side. Because now we know the person's going to do that kind of thing. Now the key, tricks. The third category, and I want to distinguish between tactics and tricks, because tactics are risky but acceptable. Tricks, by definition, are risky and not acceptable. And I think that's a useful distinction because it helps give a negotiator something to think about when they're making their choices as things are unfolding very rapidly. Love the distinction that you make between those three and the tie to choices a negotiator has at the table. Uh, I think those, I mean, that's just, yeah, makes it much more uh, tangible and useful for, for someone who's, as you said, kind of need, needing to be informed about my instinct. Sure. So that's what, so that's where that came from. So then how do you advise when responding to someone using a dirty trick? Okay. Well, that's, um, I think that, let me say one thing first about dirty tricks or tricks. I got criticized creating that category by some people. And the criticism is if you create the category, then you're approving it. And my answer to that is 
I'd rather create the category and recognize that's the reality in the marketplace than pretend it doesn't exist. Because once you recognize that we have something to discuss, which gets to your question, uh, how do we recognize a trick? What do we do with a trick? Well, first we have to know that's out there because there's a big incentive to engage in tricks because if you're successful, the payoff is enormous. And so we know people do it. People are going to lie. People are going to uh, uh, engage in different kind of games if they can get away with like good guy, bad guy routine, uh, if they can pull it off. The risk is if they get discovered, by my definition of tricks, if discovered, it just can destroy the negotiation. Tactics don't, tricks do. So now the question is, how do you discover it? So I'm gonna give you a, another story, a bigger story to illustrate things. Um, it is a, a dated story, uh, but it has a currency today. It was dated, a little bit more dated a couple months ago. Um, in 1992, 93, I had the fortunate opportunity to spend a lot of time in Russia. And I was there doing a number of programs, building a program uh, for students to come there to study and doing program, rule of law program with the American Bar Association uh, during the time when they were um, uh, struggling to build a democracy. Um, and we were trying to open up a summer program there. Uh, and the dean sends me there and says, why don't you see what you can figure out? And he just says, let's go there. So I go there. And I knew people at Moscow State University. Moscow State University is premier university in the whole, whole former Soviet Union, without a doubt. One of the top universities in the world. And, and then we definitely want to have it there if we can work it out. This is 1992-93. Soviet flag just went down. Everything's open. No one's really quite sure what's going on. So I go there for a five-day negotiation. It turns out to be five days. And we're meeting every day, trying to negotiate when we put together this program. And we get toward the end of the program. We worked out all the costs of the program. People were terrific I was working with. Uh, and at the very end, I think, okay, I think we got it. It's going to work. We know what the costs are. And then they said, oh, by the way, there is a 30% um, educational tax that we have to add to all this. And I go, 30% educational tax? I didn't know anything about this. I said, well, that's a big, uh, we, we just have to pay it. It's a, it's a tax imposed by the Russian government. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know. I said, well, that changes the economics of all this. At which point I had with me a Russian attorney. And she pulls me aside and she says, no one pays that money. No one pays taxes in this country. And I said, oh, is this a trick? <laughs> says, what is going on here? I don't know. And so we say, how to, how to deal with tricks? We first have to do our due diligence to figure out whether it's a trick or not. Because if you call someone on a trick, they're going to be offended. And you got to be sure you got it right. So I didn't know what I had here at this point, but I knew this was going to be problematic. So I remember reading, getting to yes in objective standards. So I, that night happened by happenstance having dinner with a, a friend in Russia who was doing business, an attorney, and I explained to him what just happened. He said, oh, that tax is an exemption for educational institutions. I go, really? I said, are you sure? He said, I'll get back to you tomorrow. He gets back to me the next day. He said, yes. I said, great. So instead of saying, you're not going to pay this, because to this day, I never know whether if they collected what they were going to do with it. And by the way, everything is up for grabs in that country at that point, anyhow. And, and I really wanted this relationship. So I said, why don't we hire an attorney to give us an evaluation of whether or not the tax applies to this transaction? Because if it does, it changes the entire economics of this transaction. And we agreed. We hired an attorney. We agreed to. The attorney came back with an opinion that said uh, it doesn't apply. Tax never applied. We avoided the issue whether it was a trick or not, and we proceeded. So naming it didn't it didn't matter whether so, it was a trick or tactic because of how you chose to engage with it by going to standard by a standard. Absolutely, yes, yes. Now it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes a trick is really a trick, but you can find out by going to objective standards. If the trick is a lie, you can figure it out by going to objective standards. That question we love in negotiations, uh, why do you want that? <laughs>
So ask the why question. Hey, thanks for checking out this video on Negotiate X TV. If you found any value at all, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification icon if you want to be notified of future videos. And then we also have a couple videos over here that you might be interested in checking out. If you and your small business, your team are looking to get negotiations or leadership training, then you can head over to NegotiateX.com and learn more about the coaching services we offer. Thanks, and I'll see you over in the next video.